If you would, let's turn in our Bibles to the last book of the Bible, of course, Revelation. Um, And once you get there, please find the second to the last chapter, okay? Please find chapter 21. Um, The message here today for Sunday school uh, should be a very encouraging one, at least I hope. Anyway, uh, nothing really new, um, nothing that I'm sure that you guys haven't heard before. Uh, But like I mentioned, something that is a good refresher, something that is good for us to remember, and something for us to look forward to. So if you would just follow along. Um, How much time do I have here? I think is this uh, about uh, 30 minutes, 35 minutes, something? Okay, very good. Okay, very good. So I'll probably read a little bit more than I was planning, um, but I'm sure you guys know this passage. I'll, I'll start in verse 1, and uh, I'll prob- I might even just read the whole chapter just because, uh, well, we'll see. We'll, let's just start in verse 1, uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, where the Bible says this, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Verse 8, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And then let's do this. Let's jump, uh, let's go over here and we'll just go to verse 16. Verse 16 says, And the city lieth fourscore, and the length is large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs, the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof in hundred and forty and four cubits, according to the measure of, uh, of a man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third uh, chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth barrel, the ninth uh, topaz, the tenth uh, chrysphorus, the eleventh adjacent, the twelfth an amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, uh, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth to, do bring their glory and honor into it, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day. For there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day, Lord. I do, like I mentioned, consider it a great opportunity to be here and a great joy and a blessing that I can spend uh, this day with these uh, uh, fine uh, Christian people, Lord. And I do pray that you would just help uh, this Sunday school class right now. I pray that you would just help us to be encouraged. I pray, Lord, that we would uh, just remember everything that you've done for us. And Lord, I do pray that you'd even be with and help Pastor Knickerbocker and his family as they are away. I pray you would keep them safe, bring them back here to this church safely. And Lord, I pray that you continue to bless this ministry here. And we do thank you for all you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Charles H. Gabriel was born in Wilton, Iowa on August 18, 1856. And it is said that he is associated with 8,000 hymns. And one of those hymns is, Oh, that will be glory, which goes as follows. When all my labors and trials are o'er, 
and I am safe on that beautiful shore, just to be near the dear Lord I adore, will through the ages be glory for me. Verse 2, when by the gift of his infinite grace, I am accorded in heaven a place, just to be there and to look on his face, will through the ages be glory for me. Friends will be there I have loved long ago. Joy like a river around me will flow. Yet just a smile from my Savior I know will through the ages be glory for me. Oh, that will be glory for me, glory for me, glory for me. Whereby his grace I shall look on his face, that will be glory for me. You know, heaven as described in Mr. Gabriel's song truly will be glory for those who dwell there. Heaven truly is a glorious place. It is a wonderful, magnificent place, and today we will see just that. Today as we study a message that I have entitled, Heaven, Oh, That Will Be Glory. Today as we take a few moments and study some of Revelation chapter 21, today as we take a few moments and really focus on heaven, we're going to touch on several things relating to the eternal home of God's people. And we are going to see several things that, we should be, that should be a great encouragement to us. Like I mentioned, things that I'm sure we've all heard before. Things that I'm sure we've even heard as well. some of us were in Sunday school and just different stories and songs that we have sung. Things that we have heard before. But today, I want to just revisit those things and kind of refresh our memories on those things and, and have uh, this uh, message, this uh, Sunday school class here be an encouragement to us on the eternal dwelling place of those who are saved. So therefore, first off, number one, I want you to notice the prophet associated with heaven. The prophet associated with, uh, with heaven. If you would glance back at Revelation 21 and look at verses 3 through 6 with me where the Bible says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with me. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. Verse 4, I love this. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat uh, sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, uh, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Here in the passage I just read, we find how a great voice from heaven spoke with the Apostle John, and as this voice communicated with John, he told him of some of the benefits, some of the blessings, some of the good. Uh, The great voice from heaven tells John of the profit that those who dwell in heaven will have. For instance, as verse 3 tells us, God will dwell with them and they shall be His people. God Himself will be with them. The God who created all things, the God who sustains all things, the all-powerful, all-knowing, present everywhere God, the God who doesn't have a beginning or an end, the eternal God, the one and only true and living God, will be with them. And He will be their God. That right there is the best of all. That right there brings joy to my heart. But even though being with Jesus, being with God in heaven would be enough, would be worth it all, even though being in, uh, with God in heaven would be all we need, the Bible tells us of some other wonderful things about heaven. You see, in verse 4, the great voice continues to reveal the prophet that will be in heaven. And verse 4 tells us that God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Also in the same verse, in verse 4, we are told that there will be no more death, no more separation. There will be neither uh, any more sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. And all former things are passed away, all former things go away, all former things depart, they will be gone. And then in verse 5, the Bible tells us that uh, the Lord will make all things new. Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 through 19, put it this way. For behold, I create new heavens and new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mine. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13 says, Nevertheless, we according to His promise look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. The prophet that we just heard of in these passages is amazing. And the great thing is this prophet doesn't just apply to the Apostle John. 
It doesn't just apply to the children of Israel. It doesn't just apply to the, those Peter was writing to in 1 Peter. Rather, it can apply to you. It applies to all who dwell in heaven for all eternity. It applies to all who will be with the Lord forever. Just think about this for a moment with me. I know it can be hard to imagine as I was even preparing for this lesson. I was thinking, wow, this is, I just can't even wrap my, my head around it. It's hard for me to grasp, but I want you to think about the profit that those of us who will go to heaven will have. Think of the profit that those of us uh, who will be in this holy city will have. Think of the profit that you can have. There will be no more tears. God Himself will wipe away all tears. They will, they will be gone never to return. There will be no more death. In heaven there will be no car accidents. There will be no death because of cancer, I'm sure every one of us in this room has known somebody who has been inflicted, uh, affected with uh, the horrible disease of cancer. I'm sure we all know that maybe even people that have passed away because of that horrible disease of cancer. But when we get to heaven, those who are in heaven will, have to, will not have to worry about that anymore because there will be no more death because of cancer. There will be no lives lost because of drunk driving. You know, I had uh, my cousins back when they were younger. Luckily, they did not. Uh, none, luckily, they all made it out alive. But uh, back when they were younger, they actually got hit by a drunk driver. But you see, when you get to heaven, you won't have to worry about that. There will be no more lives lost because of drunk driving. There will be no more murders, no more drug overdoses, no more suicides. There will be no more terrorist attacks, no wars. There will be no funerals. In heaven, this holy city, will, there will be no sorrow. Life on this earth is full of sorrow. There is sorrow because of sin. There is sorrow because of Satan. There is sorrow from broken relationships. There is sorrow from missed opportunities. There is financial sorrow. There is sorrow brought about because of physical ailments, because of physical problems. There is sorrow wherever you turn. But in heaven, there will be no sorrow. There will be no more crying and there will be no more pain. I think of my grandfather. He's had heart issues. He's had cancer. He's been, he's been in a lot of pain because of diabetes. He's had to give himself shots daily for years. He has been to the hospital several times. He has had one of his legs amputated. He has trouble walking on this earth. He has pain on this earth. But when he gets to heaven, praise the Lord, he won't need shots anymore. He won't need his prosthetic leg anymore. He won't need his wheelchair. He won't need his cane anymore. He won't have all the doctor's visits. He won't go to the hospital anymore. When my grandfather gets to heaven, he will have no more pain. I think of my aunt. She, was, uh, she went through so much on this earth. She went through so much pain on this earth while she was dealing with brain cancer. But now that she is absent from the body and present with the Lord, now that she is in heaven, she has no more pain. And not only all of that, but all of the things that cause us sorrow, that cause us pain, that cause us to cry, all the former things shall not be remembered. They won't even come to mind. There is much profit to look forward to for those of us who are headed to heaven. So first, we just briefly saw uh, some of the profits, some of the exciting things, some of the things, the benefits that you could say uh, associated with heaven. And now number two, I want you to notice the particulars. Second, today I want you to notice the particulars. Please take a look at Revelation 21 again and follow along as I read verses 9 uh, through 21. We've already read most of them, but I'm going to read them again if that's all right. I think it's always good to uh, you know, read, read the Word of God. So uh, Revelation chapter 21 verse 9 says this, And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying, come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the twelve gates uh, twelve angels, and names were written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east uh, three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. 
And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof, and the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed twelve thousand furlongs, the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof an hundred and forty and four cubits according to the measure of a man that is of the angel. And we already read this, but verse 18, And the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third uh, chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth, uh, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, uh, the seventh chrysalis, chrysalis, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysphorus, the eleventh a jacinth, the twelfth an amethyst. In verse 21, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. Here in the book of Revelation, we are giving some details of the eternal home of the saved. Now, I might mention this in a little bit, but I've heard a lot of different things about Revelation, and no doubt there are metaphors, I would say. No doubt there are certain things in there that are, that are uh, um, not necessarily literal, but more of a metaphor. But I do believe that when we talk about this, is my personal opinion, I do believe that the things here that are talked about about this holy city, I believe that they're literal. I believe uh, the different things about the, uh, this and the things that we read and the things that we're going to talk about, I believe um, that they are, it's literally how it is going to be. And, and we are given these details here. We are given the details of the eternal home of the saved. We are given some specifics. We are given the particulars of this city. And as we take a look at these particulars, I want you to picture it with me in your minds. Like I mentioned, it's, it's hard. It's hard for me to picture it just because of our, our intellect and the things that we've even seen in this world. Sometimes it's hard for me to wrap my head around how great this is as we're even reading through these and half of these names of these stones I can't even pronounce, right? But it's, it's hard for me to even fathom these different things. But I want you to picture it with me in your mind. I want you to see it for yourself that this holy city, that this heavenly city truly is an incredible place. For example, in verse 11, the Bible tells us that this city has the glory of God. That her light was like unto a stone, the most precious, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. In verses 12 through 21, we find how the wall of this city is not just your ordinary wall. It's not just your average wall. It's not just a wall that has uh, been put together by some standard brick and mortar. It is not just some wall that ha was put together using some materials from the local home improvement store. The truth is this wall has 12 foundations, and in those foundations are the names of the 12 apostles. This wall is 144 cubits tall. That means that this wall is over 200 feet tall. This wall has foundations that are garnished, that are decorated, that are adorned with all kinds of precious stones. Stones like but not limited to jasper and sapphire, topaz and emeralds. Also, this wall has 12 gates, three on each side, and these gates are made of 12 pearls. And I would say since this wall is so great and so large, these pearls have got to be large. I've seen some pearls before. I remember back in Minnesota when I was growing up, a lot of times we would go to the Minnesota State Fair. And the State Fair, I remember it was huge. They would call it the Great Minnesota Get-Together because there was a lot of people that would go there. But I remember, especially when I was younger, there was even one time that my aunt and uncle, they came from North Carolina and we went to this, uh, this, um, this fair. And I remember there's this one thing when you go into this building, one of these exhibits, and you walk around on the inside, there was this exhibit where you could pick an oyster or whatever it was out of there and then they would pop that open and there would be a pearl in there and you could get that pearl. You could have a necklace made out of it or something like that. And I remember looking at it, even thinking to, the, to this day with these real, real pearls, how incredible they are and just how they're even created and, and just the way that God even put His, uh, his uh, handiwork into that pearl and just how amazing it is. But uh, as I remember, I look back into it, these pearls weren't huge pearls. <laughs> They were little pearls. They were beautiful. And some people have necklaces with pearls on them and stuff like that. But I want you to think about these. These pearls that it talks about in the Bible, they've got to be large. 
Think about the wall that we're talking about, how tall it was, how big it was. And then you have the gate that is made out, of, each gate is made out of a pearl. You know, I, like I've said, I've seen some pearls before. I've seen some beautiful pearls before. But, uh, but I don't imagine anyone has seen pearls like these before. But then there's the actual city. Now, in our world, there are some pretty fascinating cities. In our world, there are cities with extremely tall buildings that reach thousands of feet into the air. In our world, there are some cities with large populations, some with millions and millions of people. In our world, there are cities that have attractions. I haven't been to a whole lot, but one that comes to mind is I've been to St. Louis and we've gone up the arch and, we're stay, uh, and you can stand up at the top and you can look out and see everything there that's around. And we went up in that gateway arch and then there's even sometimes, you know, we've, I've been to Washington, D.C. before and we've seen the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial and just all those different things. There's a lot of different places in our world and that's just in America. There's other places like even... Um, like even uh, Brother Knickerbocker, you know, France and all that. There's a lot of cities there uh, or a lot of places there that uh, are, attract people. But in our world, there are cities that have attractions that draw people from all over the world. In our world, there are some compelling cities. But even though that is true, even though there are some per se breathtaking cities in our world, the city that Revelation chapter 21 speaks of is far greater. It is far more magnificent. It is far more breathtaking. It is far more extravagant and elegant than the cities of this world. It is far more extravagant than the cities that have been made by man. All of the cities we have here, sure, some of them might you know, rest up against a river or some might have mountainous regions in it and different things like that. But all of these buildings and all of these things that we're talking about in the, the gateway arch and different things like that, they're made by man. But you see, the city that we're talking about isn't made by man. The city that we're talking about was made by God. And it is a city like no other. For instance, the city mentioned in Revelation chapter 21 is four square. Its length, breadth, and height are all the same. It's exact. It's the same. It's square. As verse 16 of Revelation chapter 21 shows us, this city is 12,000 furlongs which equals, I believe it's about 1,300 miles. I believe it's almost close to 1,400 miles, but somewhere between 13 and 1,400 miles, this city is a large city. Also, this city is a beautiful city. As I'm sure we're, we all know, the streets in this city are not like the streets that we are accustomed to. Uh, like, I, like I mentioned, we kind of live down in the Dover area, and they just repave the street. We kind of live out in the country, out there. The um, Lord really led us and gave us the place that we live in, but we live out in the country, and they just repaved our road. And I love it when they just repave the road. It's kind of a pain when they're working on it, and just because you get stuck, and sometimes late for work, and different things like that if you don't plan ahead. But I... I I, uh, I love it when the, there's a freshly paved road. I remember when I was younger and they would repave a road, I'd get my rollerblades on there and, you know, I'd rollerblade down the road. It's just, it's just awesome. But the, the, the streets here in, he, in the city, the heavenly city, are not like anything, the streets we are accustomed to here. The streets in this city are pure gold, the Bible says, so pure that it is if it is transparent. It is like it is clear. But there's more gold than just the streets. Revelation chapter 21, verse 18, uh, B says, And the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. The actual city, the city itself is pure gold, like unto clear glass. And not only all of that, but I believe, like I even mentioned, I believe this city is real. I believe heaven is a real place. Some people and even some different religions, which I don't know why anybody would want to be part of those religions, but some different religions uh, say differently. Some other religions, in a sense, kind of uh, uh, don't believe in heaven or their, their uh, idea of heaven is very skewed. But I believe that heaven is a real place. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16 says, But now they desire a better country. That is a heavenly Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He hath prepared for them a city. 
Hebrews chapter 13, verse 14 says, For here have we no continuing city. We don't have a continuing city here. Cities come, cities go. Even a lot of the cities in the Bible and different things like that or these great nations or these great groups of people have come and gone. And here it says, For we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. This city that we're gonna, that's to come, this, this city that the Bible talks about, this heavenly place, this heaven, heavenly dwelling place for those that are uh, God's people is going to be a continuing city. It's going to last forever. It's an eternal place. John chapter 14, verse 2 says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Heaven isn't a metaphor. It isn't something that has been made up. Heaven truly does exist. And it is something that we should look forward to. It is something that we should long for. It is something that should bring joy to our hearts. And is something that each and every one of us can have a part in. What I mean by that is you can go to this city someday. You know, there's a lot of things and times and we have going on vacation. I even think of my, my daughters. They were so excited to come here today. So excited. It was awesome. But, you know, they were so excited to come to Wilmington as we told them. You know, the last time we were here, I think... It was the Get Acquainted meetings, if I remember correctly. And this looks great in here. It just looks awesome. But they were so excited. And I was asking, you know, asking them if they had remembered this place when we were sitting there. And, and uh, when we were pulling in, I don't, they were like, I don't remember this place. And just different things like that. But you see, they were looking forward to coming here. And I remember even as a young kid, as we'd go to visit grandma or we would go on a trip or something. And we were looking forward to going there. And you know... You can look forward to, and we should look forward to going to the city someday. You can have pro the profit that comes along with heaven. You can experience the particulars of this city. And with that being said, that brings us to number three. And for number three, let's spend a few moments looking at the participants of heaven. The participants of heaven. Of course, I'm not going to cover specifically every single detail about the participants, but you'll see what I'm talking about here in a little bit. But number three, I want to spend just a few moments looking at the participants of heaven. Verse 27 of Revelation chapter 21 says this, And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. As you can tell from verse 27, there's a contrast here. The Bible describes what won't be in heaven. And I believe we could say, who won't participate in heaven? The Bible tells us who won't be in heaven and who will be in heaven. The Bible says, anything that defileth whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie will not enter in. Then the Bible says, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Those that are written in the Lamb's book of life will enter into this city someday. The Bible is very specific. We will spend eternity in one of two ways. John chapter 3, verse 36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. I for me I love that verse because I know where I'm going but it's scary for those who don't. I want you to think about it. At the end of it says but the wrath of God abideth on him. Think about that. God is the one, the God of the Bible, the God of heaven is the one who had enough power to create everything. He's all powerful. The God of of heaven, the God of the Bible is all powerful. He created everything. He sustains everything. He can do whatever he wants. And here the Bible says that if uh, if you don't believe on the son, the wrath of God abideth on him. Not just for a little bit. It doesn't say that the, you'll suffer the wrath of God for a short period of time. The Bible says that it abideth on him. It'll be a continual thing. It'll, the wrath of God will be on uh, whoever uh, doesn't believe on the Son forever. And you know, each and every one of us will either have everlasting life or we will not see life. 
We will spend eternity in one of two places. We will, we will either spend eternity in the lake of fire or we will spend eternity with Jesus. We will spend eternity in the place called hell or we will spend eternity in the place that we've been learning about here for a few moments. There is no middle ground. You won't be annihilated like the Jehovah's Witnesses believe. You won't live on this earth that we currently live on. You won't be incarnated into uh, some other earthly being like some religions believe. Like I mentioned, I work part-time at Capital Baptist, but I also have a part-time secular job. And at my secular job that I have, there are some people that believe in that. They are some people that are of a certain uh, belief system where they believe that they will be incarnated. Once they die, they'll be incarnated and they just kind of keep going on. It's kind of interesting, but you see, that won't happen. You won't be incarnated into some other earthly being and live on this earth as something else. Rather, you will either uh, not see life or you will see life. Rather, you will not enter into heaven and go to the place called hell or you will enter into heaven. You will either participate in everlasting torment or you will participate in eternal life. The choice is ours. God doesn't force us to participate or be a participant in heaven. He hasn't made us robots. And He hasn't also said this, uh, you can go to heaven, you can't go to heaven, you can go to heaven, you can't go to heaven. He hasn't done that. He hasn't selected some people to go to the place called hell, and He hasn't selected some people to go to the place called heaven. Of course, He's all-knowing, so He knows who's going to choose, but He doesn't force people to go here, and He doesn't force people to go there. God doesn't force us to participate in this holy city. He won't force us to take part in what we've been discussing. He gives us the choice. He allows us to choose. So that leads me to ask you, are you going to participate in heaven someday? Have you made that choice? Will you be a participant in this holy city someday? Have you been saved? If not, you can be today. And I would imagine this is Sunday school. So I would imagine that everybody here has made a profession of faith. And that is great. But if not, if you're not sure, you can be today. The way to be a participant, the way to go to heaven, is you must be written, your name must be written in the Lamb's book of life. And there is only one way to get your name written in that book, in the Lamb's book of life. There is only one way to be saved. Despite what some may say, despite the fact that some people say, all roads lead to heaven. Despite that, despite what some say, the Bible says there is only one way to heaven. There is only one way to the Father, and that way is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 14, verse 6 says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I'd say that's pretty clear right there. I would say that kind of settles everything. Jesus is the only way. So if you haven't already, you can come to the Father today. You can have a home reserved for you in heaven today. I want you to take Evangelist Billy Sunday, for example. It is said uh, that Billy Sunday was saved in 1886 at the age of 23. Pretty interesting story. Uh, pretty awesome if you think about it. But that means at the age of 23, Billy Sunday's name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And therefore, obviously, I don't know Billy Sunday. I, yeah, I definitely don't know Billy Sunday. I don't know his heart. I don't know uh, if he truly got saved. Only Billy Sunday would have known that and the Lord truly. I mean, we can definitely tell if people are saved usually by the fruit of, of their salvation and different things like that. I don't know if he for sure was saved. But according to what I've read, Billy Sunday became a participant in heaven the day he got saved. When he left this earth, when he breathed his last breath on November 6, 1925, Billy Sunday went to heaven. And the fact is, if you are not saved, you can be. You can make sure that you are saved and you can do it today. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 says, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted. And in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You can be a participant. You can become a participant of this holy city. You can have your home reserved in heaven today. You can go to heaven when you leave this earth. First, we studied the prophet of heaven as children of the Lord. We have much to look forward to 
the one we get, we get to heaven. There's so much profit that we have. No more tears, no more pain, no more crying. But especially we have to look forward to the fact that we will be with the Lord. That we will be with the One who is tortured for us. That we will be with the One who went through so much for us. We have that to look forward to, especially, like I mentioned, we have the fact uh, we have uh, to look forward to will be that we will be with the Lord. And second, we saw the particulars of heaven. There are some pretty amazing things. And like I mentioned, I believe that this portion of Scripture, what the Bible tells us about heaven, I believe it's literal. I believe that this heavenly city is going to be truly tremendous. Something that we have never seen before. Something uh, that is just amazing, breathtaking, and better than anything we've seen in this world. Second, like I mentioned, we saw the particulars of heaven. And then third, we saw the participants of heaven. We saw who will be in heaven and who won't. And we saw how you can be a participant in this place. We saw how you can be one of the ones that someday maybe walks through those pearly gates. Someday walks on those streets of gold. Someday has a mansion to yourself. Someday has a mansion that was prepared for you. And, some, and we saw that someday uh, those who are saved, those who are born again, those who know Jesus Christ as their Savior, who are children of God, will go to heaven. And then we also saw who won't. We saw how heaven truly is a wonderful place. Therefore, since heaven is a wonderful place, I urge you to never lose sight of that. Like I mentioned to start off with, we've heard these things, I'm sure, over and over. I'm sure we've heard different things about heaven before and how exciting it is. I'm sure that, you know, in Sunday school, like I mentioned, um, I know that I did anyway. Uh, I was very fortunate, and I might mention it later, I was very fortunate to be able to, when I was in Sunday school, the age of my kids, I was able to uh, have my grandmother as my Sunday school teacher for part of the time. I was very fortunate for that, and I remember, and, and I know that she uh, told me different things and taught us about heaven. So I know that these things aren't new, but they're very exciting and it's always good to have a refresher of how wonderful a place this is. And I urge you to never lose sight of that. I urge you to always look forward to the day that you will see Jesus' face when you get to heaven. Let's pray.